Money is power. We've all heard the quote, but what if I told you there's a whole academic discipline dedicated to understanding this phrase and its consequences? Well, not literally, but within international relations, there's a subfield called international political economy that examines the intersection of money, power, and geopolitics. International political economy, or IPE, can pretty much be described as if international relations and economics had a baby. At its core, IPE is the study of how political institutions, processes, and actors influence economic interactions, and conversely, how economic institutions, processes, and actors affect political interactions. Breaking it down word by word, IPE is international because it focuses on interstate economic and political affairs, it's political because domestic and international politics are variables in economic decision making, meaning that voters, interest groups, national leaders, and state goals all play a role in shaping economic policy. And IPE is economic because we are looking at the buying and selling of goods and services across borders, the global flow of investment, and the ways economic power influences the political relationships among states. It sounds pretty common sense, and that's because it is, but it's this marriage of formal economic theories of trade and finance, along with international relations study of interstate interactions that constitutes IPE. As a practical matter, it's always been the case that international relations and economics are intertwined, but IPE as a distinct academic field is no more than a few decades old. Its interdisciplinary toolset allows us to analyze a variety of political and economic situations and understand their impact on the global stage. IPE asks questions like who are the winners and losers from a particular economic policy, or how does the global economic order benefit some nations while hurting others. We can get a better picture of IPE's value by dividing it into four general subject areas. International trade, international monetary policy and finance, multinational corporations, and economic development. Starting with international trade, this area seeks to explain bargaining between states, specifically why states engage in trade wars or trade cooperation, why states adopt specific foreign economic policies, and who benefits and loses from those decisions. One of the key debates here is protectionism versus free trade. Protectionism involves the use of tariffs, quotas, and other trade barriers to protect domestic industries from foreign competition. Protectionists argue that it can help promote domestic employment and economic development, while advocates of free trade say that the removal of trade barriers can lead to increased efficiency, lower prices, and greater consumer choice. Next, we have international monetary policy and finance. The finance portion is pretty straightforward. We are looking at how financial institutions like banks, stock markets, and currency markets, as well as the regulations that govern them, affect national economies and the global market at large. This also includes how multinational financial institutions like the International Monetary Fund and World Bank influence global economic growth and financial stability. Monetary policy is where it gets a bit more interesting, at least in my opinion. So first off, monetary policy is the set of tools countries can use to control the money supply, or the total amount of money in the economy, in order to promote economic growth and employment and keep inflation in check. So if the government wants to reduce inflation, it needs to reduce the money supply by selling bonds and increasing interest rates. On the other hand, if the government wants to encourage public spending, then it needs to buy back bonds or lower interest rates to pump money back into the economy and encourage lending. Not to bore you with economic theory, but a central concept here for IPE is the unholy trinity. It's an economic principle that stipulates states can only achieve two of the three following policy directions monetary policy autonomy, exchange rate stability, and the free flow of capital. For instance, if a country wants to maintain exchange rate stability and ensure capital mobility, it will have to sacrifice monetary policy autonomy and implement fixed exchange rates. This is because the country cannot simultaneously control its monetary policy while allowing free capital movement, as capital flows can exert pressure on the exchange rate and undermine stability. Similarly, if a country aims to have exchange rate stability and retain monetary policy autonomy, it must restrict capital mobility. This is because capital movements can create volatility in exchange rates and limit the effectiveness of monetary policy. Conversely, if a country wants to maintain monetary policy autonomy and pursue capital mobility, it will have to sacrifice exchange rate stability and accept fluctuating exchange rates. This allows the currency to fluctuate based on market forces, which may introduce uncertainty and volatility in international trade. Our third area is multinational corporations. This area examines how multinational corporate activities affect the relationship between states and the global economy as a whole. Since multinational corporations operate in multiple countries, they can be seen as a product or an extension of globalization. Proponents argue that they can bring benefits such as increased employment, technology transfer, and economic growth, 
However, critics contend that they can also lead to increased inequality, environmental degradation, and reduced policy autonomy for governments. IPE also looks at how foreign investment can influence economic development, technology transfer, and employment, as well as the ways countries can regulate foreign investment to ensure that it benefits their own economic interests. Finally, we have economic development. Here we are trying to understand the ways in which countries can promote economic growth and development, reduce poverty, and improve living standards. IPE analyzes the ways in which domestic policies and institutions, as well as global economic factors, can influence economic development. The role of international organizations such as the World Bank and International Monetary Fund in providing economic development is also important. These institutions provide loans and technical assistance to developing countries, but they've been criticized for promoting policies that disproportionately favor wealthy Western countries and acting as an extension of multinational corporations. You may have noticed that organizations like the World Bank and the International Monetary Fund are reoccurring themes here. We call these organizations international financial institutions. They are part of a larger conversation around economic globalization and global economic governance, the former referring to the greater interconnectedness between national economies and the latter being how we choose to regulate a more globalized world economy. Globalization has led to an increase in international trade, investment, and migration, as well as the development of global supply chains and the growth of multinational corporations. International financial institutions are relatively recent developments in economic history and try to provide a set of institutional arrangements and international agreements that guide a stable global economy. They provide loans to developing nations, coordinate disaster relief, regulate global trade and finance, and so many other things within and beyond global economic governance. Whether all that works out or not is a separate discussion. But what's important is that international financial institutions emerged alongside globalization in the latter half of the 20th century and remain cornerstones of modern global economics. Now IPE has a myriad of theories and perspectives of viewing international economic relations, but I just want to highlight the main three. Realism, Liberalism, and Structuralism. My previous video focuses on realism and liberalism in regards to international relations in general, so check that out if you want to find out more about them. But for the purposes of this video, I want to specifically apply them to IPE. In a nutshell, realism emphasizes the role of power and self-interest in shaping international relations. Realists view the international system as an anarchic environment in which states compete for power and resources, with national survival as the main goal for each country. One of the central assumptions of realism is that economic competition is a key driver in international political economy. Economic power is seen as a key source of national power, and states engage in economic policies and practices that serve their own interests, rather than the broader interests of the global community. As such, weaker states are often forced to accept unfavorable economic arrangements. Realists are also skeptical of economic globalization, since it can lead to increased competition that hurts domestic industries and promotes economic interdependence which can threaten state survival in the most dire of situations. This positions realists to be more likely to adopt protectionist policies such as embargoes and tariffs and other mechanisms aimed at consolidating national economic interests. Realism also argues that states are the principal actors on the international stage meaning that countries are the only entities whose actions matter in global affairs. This gives realists a rather cynical take on international financial institutions. At best, they simply do not matter to realists, and at worst, they are controlled by the large, powerful states that dominate them, as opposed to building multilateral solutions to grow global economic cooperation. Liberalism, on the other hand, says that cooperation and interdependence actually do have a role in shaping international economic relations. Liberals believe that economic globalization can be a force for peace and prosperity, arguing that as free trade is embraced, countries establish industry specializations and global supply chains form. Not only does this produce absolute economic growth, but it reduces the likelihood of conflict since it becomes no longer worth it to rupture the ties of economic integration. Liberals also embrace the role of international financial institutions, unlike realists. They argue that international institutions, such as the World Trade Organization and the International Monetary Fund, facilitate cooperation, regulate global economics, and provide a framework for resolving economic and political disputes. For example, the European Union is a successful model of economic integration that has promoted peace and prosperity among its member states. If you haven't noticed yet, our global economic order is set up with liberalism in mind. That brings us to structuralism, which is a perspective rooted in Marxism. 
It focuses on the structures and systemic factors that shape and influence the behavior of states, institutions, and other actors in the international economic system. So that basically means that the global economy is characterized by inherent inequalities and power imbalances, which powerful countries and multinational corporations create and leverage to control production, trade, and the distribution of wealth. We can see this perspective reflected in how structuralists resist international financial institutions. Unlike liberals who love these institutions, and realists who largely don't care about them, structuralists believe that they are tools used to perpetuate the economic divide between developed and developing nations. For example, the World Trade Organization is criticized for primarily serving the interests of developed countries, which have the most influence in setting the organization's agenda. The same thing can be said with the International Monetary Fund, which overrepresents Western democratic nations in its staff and voting rights. This sets up structuralists to want economic growth and development that's sustainable and inclusive of marginalized groups. So that's a somewhat brief summarization of what IPE is today. But that begs the question, how did we get here? To avoid a lengthy talk about IPE's history, I'm going to give a short and perhaps slightly bastardized historical account of the field. Let's start by going back in time to the mercantilist era. It's the 16th century, and European nations are all about maximizing their wealth and power through international trade. Mercantilists believed that a nation's wealth was measured by the amount of gold and silver it possessed. So states aimed to increase exports and decrease imports through protectionist policies such as tariffs and quotas. This was the case for international economics until the late 18th century, when we see the emergence of Adam Smith's classical liberal economics. Smith believed that free trade was the key to increasing economic growth and prosperity. He argued that if nations specialize in producing what they are most efficient at and trade with other nations, then everyone would benefit. His famous metaphor of the invisible hand referred to the idea that individuals driven by self-interest and the pursuit of profit engaged in economic activities such as producing goods and services, trading, and investing. These individual actions are guided by market forces such as supply and demand, prices, and competition, and would ultimately benefit society. Free market capitalism quickly became the new global economic order, alongside the rise of modern liberal democratic states. And if you haven't realized yet, this is where the liberal perspective of IPE develops from. Then a little thing called World War I happened, ending the era of classical liberal economics. Following the war, the flavor of the day was Keynesian economics. John Maynard Keynes believed in the importance of government intervention in the economy to promote economic growth and stability. He dissents from the classical liberal idea of the invisible hand and suggests that in times of recession, governments should spend money to stimulate the economy, the most notable example being FDR's New Deal. The economic policies of the interwar period saw a return to government intervention as high tariffs and currency devaluations became common. However, government intervention never quite reached the levels seen under mercantilism since the foundations of free market capitalism were still present. The outbreak of World War II led to the collapse of the global economy once again. By 1944, the Allied powers were pretty sure that they would win the war and held secret discussions in Bretton Woods, New Hampshire to construct a post-war global economic order. The conference, which would later be dubbed the Bretton Woods Conference, was attended by 44 nations and established a new economic order built on the principles of liberalism known as the Bretton Woods System. The conference created the International Monetary Fund and World Bank, which were tasked with facilitating international capital financing and regulating monetary activities. Thinking about the unholy trinity, the Bretton Woods system sacrificed the monetary autonomy of nations participating in the agreement in favor of exchange rate stability and the free flow of capital. The system achieved this by requiring all currencies to have a fixed exchange rate to the US dollar, which was in turn pegged to the price of gold. I'm no economist, so I'm not going to explain how all this worked but this brought relative stability to the global economy which enabled the growth of international trade. Thus, the liberal order did as intended, influencing states to embrace free trade economics, which in turn led to the implementation of liberal political reforms, at least for the most part. However, the Bretton Woods system is often criticized as being an instrument of American global hegemony and neoliberalism, but that's a discussion for another time. What was important about Bretton Woods is that it brought together nations to establish a new global economic order and created international financial institutions that still persist to this day. That brings us to the 1970s, where IPE officially began to form as its own academic field. Profound economic issues of the time, such as the oil embargo and stagflation, alongside Nixon's decision to end the US dollar's convertibility to gold, brought the Bretton Woods system to a close. 
These events, as well as the new reality of globalization and importance of international financial institutions, sustained a new need within international relations scholarship to focus on global economic governance. What's interesting is that the field was born simultaneously, yet separately, in the UK and the US. Robert Cohane, Joseph Nye, Robert Gilpin, and Benjamin Cohen are some of the founding members on the American side, while Susan Strange and Robert Cox represent the British side of things. Cohane and Nye are some of the most forefront thinkers of the field, and here's a quick clip of Cohane explaining the idea behind the development of IPE. The earlier trend with Joe Nye was to, to contravene the notion that world politics is only about security affairs, and that political economy uh, is, is not an important part of it. When we started this work in 1970, um, People were ignoring multinational enterprises. Uh, they were looking at only at the state system. They considered the, the economic relations among the advanced countries to be low politics, not very interesting. Mm -hmm. What was interesting was the US-Soviet conflict, uh, nuclear weapons, uh, international crises. And our view was that that was, also, that was also interesting, but there was a whole phenomenon which was certainly increasingly important of political economy, of the use of politics to shape the economy, of the use of economic wealth to shape politics, which was not being studied. A quick tangent about Professor Benjamin Cohen, but I actually took a couple classes from him as an undergrad, which were the inspiration behind this video. But more importantly, he wrote a lot about the British-American divide in IPE. Both approaches to IPE follow the general framework laid out in the beginning of this video, however they depart on several foundational areas. American IPE prioritizes the scientific method in its mode of analysis, meaning that research tries to emulate the objectivity of hard sciences. British IPE is less attached to conventional social science and instead lends some importance to historical, sociological, and critical analysis. This results in American IPE having more focus on economics while the British weigh more emphasis on politics. American IPE tends to be a more state-centric study meaning that states are assumed to be the primary actors in global economics and thus the main focus of analysis. This positions the perspectives of realism and liberalism to be popular, while structuralism is not really entertained. The British, on the other hand, argue that states are just a portion of global actors among a myriad of non-state actors like international financial institutions, multinational corporations, non-governmental organizations, and individuals. This, along with the previous point about British IPE's multidisciplinary approach, means that it's more open to constructivist and structuralist perspectives. There is some credence to lend to the narrative that British IPE was deliberately developed to contrast what was going on on the other side of the pond, but it's an overstep to say that this was the whole story. The difference between the countries reflect long entrenched divisions in their approaches to social science, objective heart science versus subjective critical theory. This isn't to say one is better than the other, but perhaps two different, yet equally important approaches to understanding international political economy. So that's international political economy. I wanted to make a video about IPE since it's an area of international relations that I really enjoy because it's a real melting pot of theory, application, and history. Professor Benjamin Cohen and his lectures were what introduced me to IPE and were major inspirations behind this video, so I can only thank him for opening my eyes up to this field. Like always, thanks for watching.